All right, good morning, everyone. Let me uh, make some screen adjustments to share and we'll go from there. So I'm going to do a switch on you. And there we go. How's that looking, everyone? If you could give me a, a thumbs up that you see that and uh, that you're able to hear too. That's an important factor. I can see it. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thanks, Perfect. Lucas. You're welcome. Melantha, um, can we do a quick sound check for you as well? Yes, good morning. Good morning. Okay, we've got everybody online and in sound. So, um, uh, uh, one quick thing to mention just um, want to make sure that when people are chatting in, make sure that they're selecting to uh, host and or all uh, panelists um, when they're responding, uh, specifically if it's about this presentation. Uh, if you have technical challenges, you can, you can chat to Heike. But if it's about the content, um, make sure that you're including the, the panelists um, so that we can we can actually see those things. If you just had to chat it to Heiko, we can't see it. So just an FYI. Great, Lucas. Thanks so much for that reminder. So we'll go ahead and, and get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is day one of the Behavior Support Review Committee training series. And our, our goal is to take a look at how the committee operates. Um, specifically today, we're going to determine why we need that professional review. We're going to give you some data on the behavior support review committee and its impact in the past on reviewing individuals and how their risk changes over time. And then we're going to provide a, a little overview of how the behavior support review committee operates, the expectations of the committee and the expectations of the committee members. And last for today, we'll take a look at all the elements of the behavior support review committee checklist and see how they align with the task list and the compliance codes. So if you're ready to get started, we're ready to get you going. So today, as we indicated, we'll be engaging in Mentimeter. And if you could please go to, and that's an error. I, I should have had Menti, M-E-N-T-I, and you can see it up here. And use the code 49305953. And we'll give everyone just a minute to be able to do that. And then we'll get started. Okay, so hopefully everyone has uh, been able to get on Menti, and if you haven't, then please check in the, the panelist um, chat box there, and we're going to give you the opportunity um, before we get started to actually see how Menti works. So um, this is the trial question, and it is, what would you like to have for dinner today? And you've got the option of chili, chicken and dumplings, soup and grilled cheese sandwich, and I spelled sandwich wrong, um, mushrooms and rice with a cauliflower steak.
All right, look at those dots align there. We're playing connect the dots. It looks like there's uh, the soup and the grilled cheese. O is uh, winning out. All right, it doesn't appear that we've had any real technical difficulties um, and everyone can kind of get going there. So let's move on and afford you the opportunity to enter your name, your BACB, BACB number, and then your email address so we can monitor your participation for your CEUs. And as a reminder, you will need to participate in all three of the trainings to get your CEUs um, for this series. And once you've entered that information, you can see it up oh, there's Tammy's. She's got her information up there. Excellent. Allison, Anna. Nikki is wanting a certificate. Thank you, Nikki. John, you've entered your number. That's awesome. There's Molly. Thank you, Molly. Randa, Julie, great to see all you guys this morning. Yep, we have people joining. That's excellent. All right, thank you everyone. It looks like uh, we've got things going and, and people are entering their um, email address and name. If they'd like a certificate of attendance, we can definitely figure something out to do that. So just, uh, I've got a couple chats in for people that are a little confused about what a BACB number is. If you don't know what it is, um, that probably means that uh, you're not eligible for CEUs for this event. Um, BACB number is a personally uh, number that identifies you as a credential holder for um, the practice of behavior analysis. It's what's used to determine your qualifications to be licensed as a behavior analyst in Missouri. So if you don't know what it is, that's fine. Don't provide it. Um, you're welcome to attend and participate, um, but we probably won't be able to provide you with uh, CEUs for this. So, like, if you're um, a counselor and you're hoping to get CEUs, uh, we don't we don't currently have the capacity or the ability to provide CEUs for non-behavior analysts that don't have uh, BACB credentials or the BCBA number. Thanks for that clarification, Lucas. Uh, greatly appreciate it, and thanks for monitoring the chats there. And uh, of course, as I mentioned, for those who are just attending, I am sure we can figure out how to get you an attendance certificate and then you can take that um, however you'd like to do that. All right, we'll give everybody just one more minute. I think everybody has entered their information. All right, with that being said, we've got uh, 22 and I believe that's how many have logged in. So we'll uh, go ahead and move on. So today we're gonna look at uh, personal peer review and the, the W's of the process and how the behavior support review committee works. So filled with questions this morning. Uh, want to ask you, how often do you engage in professional peer review?
It looks like Weekly is winning out. And some of you may not have a peer review process. I don't know. Um, and while you all are uh, responding, we'll, we'll take this opportunity to introduce ourselves to you all so you know who we are. Uh, most of you probably, I recognize many of the names participating, so you probably all you know who we are, but it's probably good to just introduce ourselves. So um, I'm Lucas Evans, I'm the Central uh, Area Behavior Analyst, and then um, I can, I'll let Rita and Melantha introduce themselves. And Lucas, thank you so much for that reminder. I got so excited about what we were doing this morning. I just wanted to reach in there and get going. So um, again, I'm Rita Cooper. I'm the Western Region Area Behavior Analyst. And as you can tell, I'm excited to get going. And I'll turn it over to Melantha. Good morning. I am Melantha with this phone. I'm the Eastern Area Behavior Analyst. Okay, so I really appreciate that uh, people get some some weekly uh, review. Um, some haven't participated in any peer review. That's okay. We'll understand here as we move along um, why that's important. So peer review is just um, the simple process of having another um, professional review your body of work or um, your practice to give their professional opinion about the subject matter or piece of work to improve your uh, uh, quality of work. So here is another question. Feel free to answer it. You guys are doing this pretty quickly. Thank you. I love this. Everyone is in agreement that behavior analysts should participate in um, a professional review process. Awesome. One of the great things about this presentation is we um, get to discuss uh, why um, professional peer review is, in, um, is important. And so um, as clinicians, as licensed behavior analysts, we need to know, think about, and consider the legal and ethical guide, practice guidelines and uh, the context in which we are working um, so that when we're, we're designing our programs, uh, we are incorporating those things and considering those things. Um, Different, different funders have different requirements. And so um, CMS and Medicaid does not have all of the same guidelines and requirements as um, insurance. Um, Medicaid um, may have very different um, rules and regu regulations as um, schools. And so when you are um, designing those things, you want to make sure you're honoring um, all of the uh, guidelines and laws um, um, and things of that nature. So um, to con um, consider, uh, it is also very important to uh, look at our compliance codes, um, our compliance codes also um, highlight the importance of uh, a professional review process and you guys can see that information on this slide that we're obligated to uh, participate in our review process. It makes us better clinicians. 
Also, um, the compliance code, uh, again, highlights this complaint uh, code highlights uh, the important of uh, the importance of um, the professional peer review process. Uh, and when I think about the professional review process, I think about it being a um, process that allows us to grow in the area of competence uh, to, um, to gain a greater uh, level of support and the compliance code um, highlights the of being competent so that um, people get the best quality of, of service. Thank you for outlining that, Melantha. As, as you can see, um, part of the issue sometimes and, and some of the areas of ethical violations have been in improper or inadequate supervision. And that has been identified by the BACB in 2018. Um, you know, not having enough interaction with our peers, not having uh, a way to support each other. I don't know if you've seen on the, some of the Facebook groups where, you know, that inadequate supervision at the beginning has um, perhaps had people identify that, wow, I've taken the test six times and I still haven't passed, or, you know, people beyond being certified and then not being able to practice within their scope or how to get access to support outside of their scope of practice to be able to address the needs of individuals. So another supporting factor for why we do professional review is in the, the Cooper, Heron, and Heward white book, the, the Bible of what we do and how we do things. And they highly recommend or require it specifically under the conditions of behavioral severity and restrictive procedures. And one of our uh, guiding documents here in Missouri, 9 CSR 45-3.090, which is the behavior support rule, identifies that, you know, under uh, conditions of prohibited practice and other areas that we need to do that review of those plans. Another reason that we have for doing that peer review, as you can see from these headlines, and they're not very good headlines, we're in the news and not in a good way. Uh, if you can see fraud charges, filed in Centria Autism Investigation, Medicaid fraud, possibility of losing funding in Florida because of funding issues. And again, when you're billing and what you're doing, you know, you need to be aware of what the waiver requirements are and what you can bill and bill for and how you can do that. So hopefully you have that support. So let's prepare for a question. So what is the reason for professional peer review? Well, look at those dots cluster. Love the participation. Thank you so much. All right. Well, uh, thanks for your participation. That is correct. It is all of the above to protect vulnerable populations, to monitor and improve efficacy, and for those legal, ethical, and funding requirements. So I'm going to turn it over to Lucas now. Excellent. Thank you. So um, as some of you may know, um, we've had a professional peer review operating in Missouri for um, about four years now. And um, we, we routinely look at the data on that. We've actually presented some data. This is data we presented to um, ABAI and APBA 
a few years ago, back before COVID derailed everything. Um, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time on every single one of these data. They're pretty clearly um, they're pretty pretty clearly identified on here, and we're going to be talking about the elements for the remainder of this series. But I, I do want to call out a couple things. So um, this data were, was primarily from individuals who were experiencing um, significantly challenging outcomes, or high risk outcomes. They had restrictive procedures in place. So these are people that um, fall in, definitely fall into that high risk and vulnerable population that we just saw was one of the, the reasons why we do peer review. Um, and <clears throat> when reviewing these plans, well, this is about 50 people, 42 exactly, um, less than half of them were uh, sufficiently based on a, on, on a clear uh, results of a, of a functional assessment and the interventions that were described in the plan were aligned to those things. So what that really means is that there wasn't enough information to say that like a good assessment happened that had a reasonable hypothesis that was specific to that person's situation and whatever was being proposed as strategies in the plan didn't make sense within what context could be uh, identified from the plan and from collateral information. So that's um, that's a that's a a pretty large concern. Um, one of the things that you know the field has prided itself on for a long time is function-based treatment. Um, these data don't reflect function-based treatment, at least uh, based on our evaluation. Um, and this is not just a Missouri specific challenge. So I'm going to show you data from all the way across the world now from Australia, which actually is, is a very interesting place to look at this because part of um, this, this data comes from Queensland, which is a state in Australia. And part of their, their legal requirements there is that any person in the DD system, any, any um, person that's being funded and is uh, uh, residing in the DD system who has a restrictive intervention, must have a behavior support plan by statute like it's absolutely required and part of the requirement is that the behavior support plan be reviewed um, and approved by uh, essentially uh, a government agency kind of like the division of development facilities here in missouri and um, they they found similar findings they used a, a different tool than we use we'll actually talk about that in a little bit the tool that they specifically use but um they 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 see similar situations for this high risk highly vulnerable population where the the treatment that's being uh, proposed in these plans doesn't really reflect the the needs of the person in their context so not really clearly identifying the reason for the behavior in the situation, we're not even really clearly identifying what it is that we're trying to affect. So uh, we've got problems, and they don't seem to be isolated to Missouri. Um, we um, we co-presented um, a couple of years ago with Tennessee, their DD system. Um, they don't take the same data that we take, which is unfortunate. But anecdotally, um, their experience is similar. That um, often the, these elements aren't fully uh, present in the plans. And that was actually part of the reason why we did the we did the talk uh, in a couple of different places. So we recognize there are some challenges that we need to address. That's the, that's the point of the data. So a quick question there. So just in thinking about the data that we just showed, does it does it seem like we're we're really getting at what we need to get at with building plans that are likely to be successful with implemented? What do you all think? And I'm speaking muted. Okay, so um, it looks like we've got. Uh, I love that. I, I actually love this uh, way that it responds because it gives you a, a frequency distribution there in the in the shaded area. And it looks like um, a good chunk of people are kind of on the fence. Don't quite know whether they feel like we're hitting the mark or not. Um, but we do have a significant portion of the people that uh, do kind of feel like we haven't really hit the mark. And I actually would like to hear some some comments from folks 
really quick. If you could kind of give me an indication about why you why you're on the fence about whether or not we're getting the mark. So that could be an indicator that our data is not really reflecting what you're thinking about. And I'd actually like to know that. And we'll just take a few minutes for this. I know we're on a time crunch, but I would like to know. So if you again, just when you're chatting in, make sure you're chatting into all panelists. Not to Heike, because she has to. Okay, so um, we have a question that the question wasn't really highlighting the data. That's a good point. That might be a weakness of our question. What do other people think? Uh, yeah, you all won't see the chat comments because only the panelists will see. So anyway, we're going to move on. Um, thank you for those that did respond. Uh, okay, so we had another comment. Actual important thing to look at the actual outcome data for consumers. That's a really good point. Um, that's one of the things that behavior analysts um, should be looking at a lot more closely is outcomes data. Uh, and if you're a practicing behavior analyst, you should have outcomes data for your own practice. Um, we would actually like to see that. Um, we, we do have some outcomes data. It's not that great. Um, we don't really have a good way to, to track some of the, the most important pieces of like being a part of the community and living a good life. We can just really see less bad outcomes, which is what this data actually shows is that when people participate in the um, um, in the in the peer review process is that um, prior to coming to peer review so this is a, a bar plot each row represents a different year that the committee operated so this is 17 this is 19 um, and the dark line down the middle of the screen uh, represents the month that the person was reviewed in the committee and then the bars to the left of that line represent uh, six months and 12 months prior to the meeting. So this is relative to when they were actually reviewed. It's not like the line represents July and a calendar month. It represents the month they were reviewed in that year. And then it looks back a year before they came to the review and a year after in six months. Later. And what we see is over, um, over the course of three years, we see the same pattern. So before the meeting, people are continuing to get worse. These are number of, um, are the average number of risk outcomes that a person is experiencing in review. Um, and you see error bars on there that kind of give you the sense of how variable these data are. They are variable, but they are tending to move in the same direction. They look about the same from year to year. Um, at the time that they come to the review, they're kind of at their apex, their, their um, uh, asymptotic, uh, risk area or highest level of risk. And then after the review, uh, you see a, a decrease within the first six months. And then in some cases, like in 19 and 17, you see a continued decrease at the 12 month mark in 18, you see an increase. So um, one of our hypotheses is that the peer review process um, is a helpful nudge that has some short term effects of making things better. But um, as another person commented in, that there's a lot of things that go into practice beyond just peer review, and I think that's absolutely true. So there's a lot of things that peer review doesn't touch um, that uh, are important in practice. And some of those things are like basic competencies to practice, which peer review can kind of help mediate, um, but um, it's kind of maybe not the best way to tackle uh, competency-based skill set. Um, let's see. There's some other comments. Uh, somebody said that they would assume the outcome data would correlate pretty well to whether an appropriate and function-based intervention was put in place. That's an empirical question. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That is an empirical question. I'm not sure that's true. I think um, I think you could get really far with non-function-based treatments that just make people's lives good. I think that would do a lot. I think the um, the, the tiered supports or response to intervention and the multi systems of support uh, approach and public health model kind of supports that if we make people have a really good life that we tend to get less problems, even if we don't know specifically what the problems are. Um, okay, so let's go to the next data. Sorry, I'm meandering here. Uh, this is the same data. I'm, not, I'm just going to show it as another way to look at this. This is uh, one of the reasons why it's so fuzzy is, you know, we 
we have this time lag between when people come to the committees. This is just a line chart that shows you every single month, um, again, by year. So colors are years this time and not rows. Uh, the shaded band around the line, so the line is the average number. The shaded band around it is kind of the uh, what the error bar is represented in the previous. So it's like how much above and below the line uh, the data tend to fall. So it gives you kind of a sense of the variability. Um, so this is again is just another way to look at it. Um, it. It's less clear looking at it this way, just because you you see that we start having some some cresting. It was specifically in 19 prior to the meeting. So this is a question about is it the invitations? Is it the kind of being noticed that you have bad outcomes? It is the, the functioning effect or is it the actual peer review? Um, that's an important question. The data is still out on that. We're looking for better ways to evaluate it. So let's move on. So knowing that we can't 100% say Behavior score is having an impact on the level of risk. Um, thinking in terms of the data that we just showed, does it seem like there's some some risk, some um, impact happening in the committee? So for sake of time, yeah, it looks like um, it looks like most people would agree that there's some impact happening. It's not quite clear to the extent of the impact, and it's also not quite clear how long the impact lasts. Um, and as people rightly noted in the comments, that it's a really complicated system. Providing treatment to a person in the DD system involves lots of intersecting systems, and so peer review isn't like panacea. It doesn't cure everything, but it is an important part of a, a solution to a systems problem, which is to make sure people have good treatment um, and good services in their home and community-based setting. And so I am going to uh, quickly review how um, the committee operates. So the purpose of the Behavior Support Review Committee uh, is to ensure that the people who are served by the Department of Mental Health DD are receiving um, the best quality of service, uh, that they are going to reach a greater level of in independence, um, as well as um, there is a system and process in place to address um, unsafe uh, behaviors while teaching people uh, new skills. So there are several goals of the committee. We wanna make sure that we are um, meeting uh, Medicaid waiver assurances, that str strategies are um, uh, scientifically based, ethical guidelines are being followed, least restrictive interventions are um, the first step, and that uh, all of this information is documented, implemented, and uh, identified in a person's ISP and RPSP. So some of those objectives are to ensure that uh, across the state of Missouri, people are receiving great behavioral services. Um, teams have a process um, to um, access support when they are, are uh, when 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 a person is experiencing at risk or uh, poor outcomes. Um, is to ensure that there is um, an objective way to make sure that uh, behavior support plans are uh, have all of the necessary uh, requirements in them uh, and, um, and can be reviewed in an objective manner uh, and to also ensure that um, the strategies and that are listed in the person's individual support plan and behavior support plan 
our um, best practices. So another um, challenge question, which of the following is not a goal of a uh, goal or objective of the behavior support review committee? I love how you guys are jumping right in and quickly answering these uh, questions. Um, I think that we are almost in total agreement that uh, the behavior support review committee, uh, the one of the uh, that there are so many objectives and goals that the behavior support review committee wants to uh, meet. However, uh, we are not interested in um, noting the effectiveness of a day program. We do want to meet um, the assurances that are outlined in Medicaid waiver. We want to make sure that people um, have the least uh, amount of uh, restrictive interventions. And so um, assessing the effectiveness of day program is not a priority. All right, I'm ready for the next slide. I wonder if Rita got disconnected. No, this is the next slide, Melantha. Oh, maybe my uh, computer is froze because I still see which of the following is not. Oh, thank you. All right, so I can see the next slide. Um, so just a little information about the committee. The committee is chaired by a licensed behavior analyst that is uh, employed by um, BMH and uh, appointed by the division. Uh, the committee chairperson has um, many roles. One of the roles is to notify the team that their person has been selected to be reviewed for um, the behavior support review committee because they have met several um, high risk indicators for a certain per period of time. And so there's an email that goes out at least 15 days prior to, to the review and the email should include the service coordinator, the guardian, um, contractor providers, um, as well as um, other people who have a vested interest. So um, when that email goes out, um, the team is notified of the reason the person is being reviewed. Again, um, sometimes the um, 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 well not sometimes um, there is a um, case summary form that's included in the email as well as. Um, a letter that um, um, is shared with the team. And so um, those documents are a part of um, the review process. Um, it's a tracking system. Um, and so um, 
the committee person is responsible uh, for maintaining that case summary form and other documents um, that include recommendations from the committee that help to identify uh, trends and patterns uh, related to um, risk and high risk um, folks and um, outcomes associated with uh, those documents and areas of improvement um, in ways that the uh, committee can provide support with addressing uh, trans and patterns as well as um, collecting data to be analyzed to make decisions related to trainings and things of that nature. So those are some additional responsibilities of the chairperson. Uh, the committee person is also responsible for redacting uh, person documents that will be reviewed, which can uh, include the ISP and or the data support plan. Um, getting that information out to committee members, um, no less than seven days prior to uh, the meeting, and they're also responsible for. Uh, um, providing and facilitating that meeting and maintaining communication with um, committee members. So here's some information and responsibility related to uh, committee members. Uh, committee members are uh, volunteers, and we greatly appreciate um, you all uh, for volunteering your time. This is not a paid job. Uh, most most committee members are um, licensed to practice uh, applied behavior analysis. Some have a contract um, with the Department of Mental Health, and, as well as um, teach in uh, educational settings. And then there are a few members that are working towards certification and license. So some of the roles and responsibilities of those committee members are um, they're responsible for reviewing document documents that are um, sent out to them, reviewing the behavior support uh, plan. Um, completing the checklist, returning the checklist back to the chair for that month. Um, and while they are in the meeting, they're responsible for asking clarifying questions that will help lead to um, helpful, meaningful um, recommendations, as well as providing recommendations. Also, we greatly appreciate and understand that there are um, times in which um, life happens and people are not able to um, continue sitting on the committee. So we just ask that when life happens and you're able to um, participate in the committee, that you uh, inform. Um, so if you have to step down, just simply let us know. We understand. So here is another um, challenge question. So uh, the challenge question is the committee will provide plans and the committee members will ask rhetorical questions. Do you disagree, strongly disagree, or do you strongly agree?
So it looks like most of us agree that uh, the chairperson will get uh, committee members plans to review and that committee members will ask um, helpful clarifying questions and not uh, rhetorical questions. All right, so, so we're going to talk. Lucas, oh, I just to say uh, something very quickly. So when, when I think about um, the person that is having a plan, a plan reviewed, I think about uh, having your plan reviewed by the support review committee uh, a way to mitigate risk and fraud. It's a way for the person um, that is being uh, re uh, reviewed to grow um professionally because uh people are going to give them good um, recommendations as well as additional things to uh, think about and so if you have a challenging situation and you end up in court you can say that you consulted with other uh, people in the field you have experience and your information was reviewed i just wanted to highlight at least two things that uh, were beneficial for the reviewer. Thank you. Thanks, Melantha. That was good additions. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the intersection between professional practice and uh, kind of conceptual underpinnings. And I think it's always good to start off with kind of what what is a what is a behavior support plan. Um, this is a really high quality expensive graphic that we designed for this that shows what we think of behavior support plan is, which is really just like a technological underpinning or a delivery system for the, the rest of those uh, seven dimensions of applied behavior analysis that uh, Bears and Wolf gave us as good rules of thumb for, for how to have a practice. And so it's really it's really a vehicle. So it's it, it is an uh, important and inseparable part of treatment because it's how we take what we know about behavior change and kind of move towards something that can be done um, continuously to make people have good outcomes. Um, so we're we're going to continue with this presentation until we run out of time. So let's move on to the next one, and I'll start talking about some of the. Uh, what are the standards? So if we can conceptualize a behavior support plan as kind of a uh, inseparable part of treatment, so something that absolutely has to be there, where do we get standards? And we don't have a ton of literature on what standards should be, um, but we do have some. Um, let's see. Rita, could you mute yourself? I'm getting a lot of feedback. And um, okay, so uh, all the way back in 1992, uh, we kind of had our first um, set of, of uh, assertions or kind of uh, opinions about what should be in a plan. This came from a group of people that you probably don't recognize, Balmer, Iwata, Zarconi, and Rogers. Um, and what they did is looked at all of the relevant research, um, legal requirements, and kind of what was what was in, what was in the applied and basic research. It was as kind of like things that make behavior change successful. And they came up with a list of, of uh, 10, 10 elements or so. Um, and they got they uh, validated it with um, other behavior analysts to make sure that they agreed with it. They also used it um, on to review some plans and felt like they had a pretty good set of, of um, standards that would work for treatment. Um, and uh, Williams uh, and Vollmer uh, looked at that same set of components uh, quite a many years later and determined that there was some need to update based on some changes in the way that uh, we look at assessment and um, kind of the, the intervening research over the period and also changing legal requirements. But for the most part, the, those standards were pretty much still valid. Um, and then in a separate, so this, this particular effort of group was pr primarily around um, institutional care of adults with developmental disabilities in South Florida. Um, but there was an additional um, bundle of effort coming out of Southern California and the school system by a group of people um, called Brown, uh, Browning Wright, uh, Mayor and Saren, and they came up with a tool that they call the Behavior Support Plan Quality Evaluation Tool. It's now in its second, second edition, and they took a similar um, approach with kind of combing the relevant literature and legal requirements to come up with what they thought was um, a set of good standards. They validated it with uh, 
several hundred um, behavior analytic graduate students um, on both kind of content and uh, uh, component validity, so internal validity, so that people would actually score things the same. Um, and they uh, did some research that showed that um, plans that scored higher on their tool tended to be associated with better outcomes. Um, and then most recently, there was a, a really good kind of summary article by Quigley and folks in 2018. I think it was in Behavior Analysis and Practice, um, but it may have been another journal. I'll have to check. Uh, but it really kind of looked at all these things as a whole and said that there was remarkable overlap across all of these different efforts. There's a couple that aren't listed here. There's like a, a Sagai and Horner. There's a um, there's some other groups of people that have put some things out there, but that there's a, a remarkable overlap across all these different people that were working independently that said that this is what we think a behavior support plan should have, um, and that they all pretty much align with what uh, was established all the way back in 1992, and that at, at this point, um, while it still is definitely an empirical question on whether or not these components are absolutely necessary for good outcomes, um, there's enough professional consensus over enough time to, to take these as best practice standards. Um, until empirical evidence says otherwise. And so that's what we should do. Um, and so we're going to fly through uh, the elements that Missouri has adopted that really come from uh, looking at and considering all of these different uh, sources of literature. And then we're going to spend the rest of the uh, trainings that we have on this subject covering them more in depth. So let's go to the next one. Um, I, all, I, I know we're supposed to switch off these, but can one person just take them and talk through them? That way we can save time. Uh, uh, sure, Lucas, I can go ahead and do that um, and, and we'll fly through them so we can get a, a little bit of time for questions. So uh, what we have here are the elements of the checklist, the components, how they tie back to our um, overarching task list, the compliance code, and then which states include those in their checklist process. So we're going to fly through these. Our first element looks at intervention and aligning with the function, uh, antecedent conditions, behavior, consequences, and related to context. Those are important elements. And also skip the, the challenge questions till the very end. Um, behavior targeted for increase and decrease are defined in observable and measurable terms. And the task list and compliance code uh, affirm those areas. Uh, one behavior, we're looking at least one behavior targeted for increase, one for decrease. Everything's observable and measurable. And also that we have some way to tie those back to how psychotropic medications affect that. The next element is um, measurable and time limited goals for targeted behavior that improve quality of life. We look at measurable, time limited, those smart elements, and also how it affects the quality of life. And these are the supporting areas of the task list and compliance code. Skip that challenge question. Specific instructions for data collection are there and available, and we look at and want to see the um, instructions on how data is collected for the targeted behaviors and the dimensions of the behavior, and those should align. And I see some questions in the chat, and we'll get to them uh, here very shortly. And five is antecedent strategies that affect the uh, probability of targeted behaviors for increase and decrease. Uh, again, we want to look at those antecedent strategies to increase, those antecedent strategies to address the challenging behaviors. Those are before anything happens. The next element is instructions for reinforcement uh, of the behavior targeted for increase and potentially identifying reinforcing stimuli. So what's reinforcing? How are we reinforcing? And how are we determining what is reinforcing? And these, again, are those authorizing uh, or, or supporting areas of the task list and compliance code. And again, you can see Missouri, Tennessee, Florida, Georgia, and California have all agreed that those are essential elements. Uh, number seven, reactive strategies for behavior are targeted for decrease, instructions on how to respond, and 
how to decrease or minimize the reinforcement of the behavior target for decrease. We're looking at that. Um, uh, yes, the, the slides will be available. Thank you for asking, Shauna. I'm going to skip that multiple choice question. Um, next, evaluation and efficacy of the behavioral strategies. We want to look at, do you have the data in there visually displayed? Uh, you know, that's one of the things that we would love to see in plans on a more consistent basis. How is your data supporting things? Um, visual display, contextual variables are noted, demarcation of baseline, and visual progress related to um, the strategies used, you know, is the, the behavior for decrease going down and it is the behavior for increase going up. Next, fidelity. Are, are people doing things how they need to do it? Again, uh, we're looking at how fidelity will be measured, how will it be maintained, and how to communicate the progress across stakeholders. And 10, the last element, describe specific strategies to promote generalization. So, you know, they can do it at home, but they can't do it in the community. I, I always like to look at using a restroom. Uh, you know, so many ways to, to teach those skills and those skills have to be generalized. So are there specific strategies to promote that? And um, again, how are we maintaining the behavior once we get there? Uh, is a, a true false question and so um, we're going to open it up to, to questions but before we do that please again enter your name bc bacd number and email address so that we can note that you are um, completing today's training and that we have some identification that you were here in the beginning and here in the end and while you're doing that, we'll open it up for questions. So you can unmute or put it in the chat box. There was a, a quick question um, from Allison on task list four and five and the current ethics code now more probably or the one that is coming into effect. All of the information we have is related to the current task list and not the um, future um, ethics code um, that's uh, going to be in effect. So these are the, the current. Um, also, as a reminder, if people are freaking out because we went through that really quickly, just, just remember uh, this was a quick overview. We're going to be covering each one of those elements in depth um, over the next several sessions. So um, if you feel like you don't understand them yet, that's okay. That was that was basically just to show you that we have elements that are based on uh, best practice standards established in the literature and tie back to our compliance, uh, ethical, and professional requirements. So that's really the only point of, of showing that at this point is just to show you that we have standards. They come from somewhere. They're not just made up. Um, and we'll go into the specifics of each and every one of them in the next sessions. And also that uh, other states use those elements in are reviewing plans so you can kind of take a look at that to substantiate that you know they weren't just pulled out of anywhere it's based on the the literature that uh, lucas had mentioned and then culminating with comparison with other states and other entities Okay, I see it is 10 o'clock and it looks like we've got everyone entering their information. I want to thank you all for joining us today and uh, going through the information about how the committee works and a, a very quick overview of the checklist. And again, as Lucas said, we'll be 
going through that in depth over the, the next two trainings that we'll have, and, and those will be um, next Wednesday and the following Wednesday. So, um, Melantha, Lucas, Heike, anything that uh, for the good of the many? Uh, we did have one question with how, how committee, how are committee members selected to do the reviews random for 81 on the committee or a rotating schedule. So, uh, we have. Um, just really quickly, because I know we're at time, but, um, we, we try to be flexible and let people sign up for which days of a month that they would like to, to serve on the committee. And then we also try to, um, kind of, uh, assign out plans to be reviewed. Um, based on how many committee members are on that day and to try to balance um, making sure several people review a plan versus um, people not having too many plans to review. So it's it's semi random, but it also is with looking and trying to make sure that we're not overwhelming people with lots of plans to review. Hopefully that answer, answers the question. Uh, so uh, when will slides be available? If you're using Menti right now, um, I believe you should be able to download them here in about 30 seconds. I don't, isn't that correct, Rita? Yes, that's correct. And, um, you know, when we actually put this on the, the website for the, the state as a, a training, the uh, PDF form of the, the slides will also be available. But you should have those slides available through Menti as soon as we are finished here. There's another question as to uh, can people send in their behavior support plan to be reviewed? Um, we always welcome that. It uh, also what we do for selection is to uh, get folks who are uh, very presenting lots of risk. So we'll try to schedule things in as we um, align and, and try to get those behavior support plans or elements or ISPs in to, to review. So we're always welcoming self-referrals. All right, that's all we have for today and we'll see everyone uh, next Wednesday. I think same time, same bat channel, same bat time. Um, thanks again.